Good afternoon once again. I wanted to do a follow-on uh, sermon on the sermon I gave a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it's closer to a month ago now. And I've entitled it The Gaza Strip 2.0, What Sephaniah Prophesied About the Remnant of Judah. I mean, that is a uh, concise statement. And Sephaniah makes some very uh, definitive prophecies with regard to the remnant of Judah in, in this context. And I just want to, I want you to do two things. One, um, we live in a period of time, and if you've been following Darius McNeely's commentary, um, the world is not going to be the same geopolitically after uh, this war that is continuing again after the short ceasefire. It's going to change. The outcome uh, in the near term may not be, we may not know exactly what it looks like, what it will look like, but it'll change things. And number two, and this is the more important point, as we go through this, I'm, I'm going to try to put this into a context, a framework in scripture that you can have confidence in because there will be a lot of deception and confusion and noise and people um, pontificating about end time events and the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. So the second thing I, want, uh, I hope that we can all go away with from this is that you can look into scripture and at least we have a contextual framework in which we can place some of these things so that we don't need to be dismayed or terrified by the terrifying events that are rocking our world. And we've not seen anything yet. Let me repeat that. We have not seen anything yet. As terrible as the situation is in Gaza and in Israel, and my brother Dan is here last evening. He was at our house and shared the pictures of their trip to Israel and actually had a couple photos of rockets stri going through the air and also a damaged home. So those things are earth-shattering and um, will change the world in ways that we don't maybe fully comprehend. But we've not, as we will see in some of the scriptures we will look at, we've not seen anything yet. We live in a lap of luxury and complain about all kinds of inconsequential things. And isn't that amazing? You know, we can, oh, you know, I mean, the, you know when, when, when I lived in Germany, I, this has been a long time ago, but we, we would uh, choke about sitting at a bar complaining about how terrible the world is. And then everybody goes home in a Mercedes. You know, you have to understand a Mercedes in Germany is kind of like a Ford here. You know, it's what, what everybody drives. Because you don't have anything really justifiable to complain about. So you, you know, complain about not having the same, dare I mention this, the same quality of shoe as, you know, some of our government servants. I, I want to make sure we, we, you know, that I get equal time here, Tim, okay? Last week he had the bully pulpit, but this week I have more of it, so. But, I mean, seriously, um, we, we really live in unprecedented, in an unprecedented lap of luxury. It's never, it's never been this nice before. So let's take a look at what has been happening in Gaza. And I'll recap uh, just so that we can kind of set the stage and, and re rewind the tape. I'll recap what we covered a few weeks ago. The Gaza Strip, as everybody now knows, is a narrow strip of land on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea that is actually only about five miles wide, depends on where you're at, and um, 365 square kilometers, but two million people lived there. Um, 
Many have been now crowded into the southern part of Gaza, and many have died. Number two, Gaza was first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis chapter 10, verse 19, in the Table of Nations. That's when it first appeared, and then we tracked it uh, throughout the Bible. It's mentioned relatively frequently. Here is an important point. Gaza has been continuously inhabited since that time and was never conquered by Israel and Judah. It was subdued. You know, David subdued the Philistines, as did Solomon, but if you look at a map of the kingdom of David and Solomon, which we reviewed the last time, you will notice that actually the quote-unquote Gaza Strip, the, Philistine, the Philistia, covered a bigger a bigger period, bigger geographic area than what it does today. But they never um, congregated. it. They, it was continuously inhabited. Number four, um, Hamas is a powerful word with dual meaning. You know, Ar Arabic and uh, Hebrew are sister languages. And it's interesting, if you look at the definition here, Ham Hamas in Hebrew actually means vilest, evil, wrong, terror. So when, when a Hebrew-speaking Israeli hears the word Hamas, I mean, while Hamas, H-A-M-A-S, is an acronym for a terrorist organization, to them, this is what they hear, right? The interesting th part is that the Ar uh, Arabic-speaking individual thinks of it, it, you can see that the words are related, but there's a difference in meaning, zeal, fervor, fanaticism, and fire. It's kind of like the word patriotism, perhaps, that, that we use, use in English. So these, these four points are, I think, a, a good recap of what we covered the, the last time. So I'd just like to take a little bit of a review of the current situation. And we'll look at some maps and, and, and what has occurred and, and, and the status of things. Um, you know, a lot of fire power, power has been unleashed. So here, here you have a, a map of Gaza. Just It shows the perimeter. You see that back in the back? Jacob says yes. Okay. So you see the perimeter. I mean, they've secured it. And the next map will show how Israel has literally cut the, the strip in two um, in order to um, conquer and control the area. So you have a, um, a red line, which is what we've historically called no man's land. It's no go, don't go there. And a high risk area. Um, and then you see the... the the darker gray, and my, my cursor does not work up there on the screen, but if you, if you see the darker gray areas, that's where they have refugee camps. So what's now happening is millions of people are literally being pushed into very constricted areas. And the other, the other statistic that we um, should be aware of the fact that of the two million people, in very approximate terms, about half of them are under age 18. So, I mean, you can um, imagine the, um, the humanitarian situation that has developed here, and a lot of people are asking... <laughs> I saw a, an interview between Jordan Peterson and a, a British news commentator and the question was asked, you know, he, he said, I'm, I'm having um, a real moral dilemma about this war, I mean, and all that. And, and Peterson, I, uh, being a psychologist, answered, I, I thought it's interesting uh, how he answered it. He said, well, I, he doesn't find that surprising that it is a m moral dilemma because um, war, <laughs> when everything else fails in conflict and you are not able to resolve it, um, morally, then you end up in war. So, by definition, war is immoral. Um, and I think that's something that has been hard for people to accept. I mean, they, they declared war. 
And when you go to war, people get killed, a lot of people, and a lot of innocent people get killed. That is simply a consequence of not having solved the problems in a better way. So we have a situation, I mean, you can you see all kinds of heartbreaking pictures of little kids and babies uh, being hurt or even and, and killed uh, because they find themselves in the, in the crossfire. And, um, you know, that does raise the question, then why? Well, there is, there is an answer to that question, an ultimate answer that we'll get to here in a few minutes. So here is another map of the um, current situation, and the pink is where uh, the Palestinians still in large part occupy. The blue is where the Israelis are at, and if we zoom in here a little bit closer, you'll notice that what they did is they came in from the north, and then they punctured through in the center and went all the way to the sea, and there where you see Gaza City, I mean, they've actually established a beachhead uh, to be able to resupply their soldiers uh, with equipment and munitions. So in, in um, cutting through the center, they've been able to establish also um, supply routes uh, for um, hum humanitarian aid to come in and also for uh, people to exit. One report that I was looking at a, a few weeks ago, this has been, it showed people leaving, um, and, and this is, you know, again, the, the situation is bad, but it's also true that the Israelis are more conscious of um, making sure that people have a way to get out, and it showed an area where, you know, people were leaving. I mean, <laughs> you're literally walking out with what you can carry in and put on your back. Again, we have nothing to complain about, you know. <laughs> Imagine if, if we had no electricity. Um, I, I learned last evening that uh, hackers are hacking in to um, water plants um, in Pennsylvania and, and other in small mu municipalities and, and shutting down the, the water systems Electricity is largely centrally supplied. So you take away water and electricity and fuel, things that we take for granted uh, would quit working very quickly. And that's the case here. They have now for roughly, what is it now, six weeks or so, um, largely um, not, have, not had electricity and power. Okay, here is, these, these are recent um, photos. Here, you know, we look at this and you say, okay, I mean, we're burying the dead. We don't normally bury dead with front end loaders, okay, and body bags. I mean, this is the, this is the reality on the ground. This was, um, this is a photo that was taken on November 22nd, so just a little bit over, over a week ago. <coughs> This is um, a picture of bombardment, uh, November the 22nd. Um, if you, again, this, this is the kind of thing that a picture does not do justice. Um, and the problem, as you've seen in news reports, uh, with the underground tunnels and the commingling of military and civilian sites um, makes the situation impossible. Israel has stated unequivocally that Hamas militants are walking dead men and that they will not stop until they are all dead and they're going to hunt them out um, in other countries as well. Um, now this is, this, is, this is the voice of a very determined people who um, have been a distinct minority down through the years, and they, it has steeled them. I, I was in Israel about 10 years ago, and the most memorable 
speech, if you will, that our guide gave us was in the Dome of the Book. I mean, this was an Israeli educated in, in Bos at Boston University and then subsequently took another eight years of training to be a guide in Israel. And at the Dome of the Book, the Dome of the Book is where they have a nuclear bomb-proof vault in which resides the Dead Sea Scrolls, including the Scroll of Isaiah. Because they determined that they are going to build a vault that will survive a nuclear blast so that there would always be evidence of the, their legitimacy to this land. I mean, that's, that's the, you know, the age-old question. And, and the question is one of God promising Abraham and his descendants to have those lands, and it talks about from, the, from Egypt to the river Euphrates. That's what was ceded to the descendants of um, Abraham, and, and they've never um, really occupied that much. But the Jews realize, and I have to get back to what this individual said in the Dome of the Book. I, I remember him, and he was, he was very articulate, and he, he's wearing a microphone, and you know, we have a, a group, and we listen to him. He was, he was really interesting to listen to because unlike many guides you know, where you can tell they've, they've got a script, and they, they, they just go on their script, and if you ask them one question and you kind of get them off their script... Um, they, they get, you know, nervous and they can't really answer. This guy, you ask him a question, and then he really got into detail. I mean, he just, he just really knew his stuff. Um, so, very articulate individual, but in the Dome of the Book, he got passionate. And he talked about his parents and grandparents and the Holocaust, and he said, never, ever again. We will die, every one of us, before we will allow to happen what, will, what happened to us back in the, in the previous century. And you could tell the determination. And the, the other thing that's happening right now is Jewish people from all over the world are coming back to Israel in droves because there are two reasons. One is to help defend Israel. But two, they feel safer in Israel at war than they do in the country where they are coming from. And, and you know, there's some statistics. There are about 20 million Jews alive in this world today and about 2 billion uh, adherents of, uh, of uh, Islam. So when, when you look at that proportion, it, is not, it shouldn't surprise us the the, the pro-Israel, pro-Palestinian demonstrations that we have seen. Um, and, and that will, will continue to be the case. <clears throat> this is um, a photo of uh, Palestinians fleeing Gaza on Friday, November the 24th. I mean, that's just a little bit over a week ago. Um, Israeli tanks... Um, you know, that area um, only weeks before would have looked very different. You know, when you start um, unleashing munitions of the sort that come out of those barrels and those tanks, um, it, it unleashes destruction. And these are still, con this is all conventional warfare. I mean, look at this. That's Gaza City on November 29th. I mean, you look at that, you know, we're out in the country, not that many houses, but, you know, imagine a major city like New York City, for example. I mean, we had the devastation of the Twin Towers, but it was only two homes. This has just been leveled. And, you know, again, you, you can, <laughs> if, if, if you want to make a moral argument, war is immoral. So it's kind of hard to make a moral argument. But if the objective is to root out every single 
Hamas militant, this is, the, what, what, this is what it's going to look like afterwards. That's just the, that's the consequence of that objective. The question is why? Well, you know, there are many reasons why, but here's the, in the grand scheme of things, I believe it comes down to this. God prophesied that certain things are going to be. And the time for those things to be apparently have come. We'll, we'll look at a timeline here in a minute. So you can, you can cast blame and assign this and do that, but at the end of the day, uh, it's about God's word being proven to be accurate. And when God said to the Israelites that Canaan had become a land that was vomiting out its own inhabitants for the abominations that they were doing, and the Israelites never carried out that promise then, and it has dogged them all, all this time. But at the end... What God said would happen is going to happen, and we, we see that now. Here's a contrasting. This is Gaza Beach uh, in August of 2022. Remember I, when, when I put that map up and showed the blue area of Gaza City, I said Israel has established a beachhead. Well, here's what it looks in November of 2023. I mean, you know, if I flip back and forth here, See the building back there with the red roof? Okay. Got everybody out on the beach. This is what it looks like right now. The, right there in the middle is the building with the red roof. They have armored D9s. Now, I, you know, <laughs> um, my son Daniel has a D6. You know, I kind of pay to run it. You know, there's... There's something masculine about getting on top of a hunk of iron like that and, you know, after arguing with automotive customers all week, you drive up against a tree or a rock and mm, there's just some real satisfaction to see it move. But this, what you see s sitting there uh, in the bottom of the picture is a D9. It's a much bigger machine. You see, um, as we'll see in the prophecies of Sephaniah, the moonscape, as some political and news commentators of Gaza City that we're seeing right now, it, it won't take long for a D9 to turn that into pasture land. You just bulldoze everything, and that's what's been done. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan, do you have your computer with you? It's too bad. I mean, he, he showed us a number of pictures last evening where they had to remove 30 to 50 feet of um, dirt in order to get down to the time of Christ. It had been bulldozed over that many times. You, know, you, just, you, you have a siege, you destroy the buildings, and you pile everything on top, and you know, that is just layer upon layer, and it just keeps happening. It is archaeological evidence that man is incapable of ruling themselves. That's just what it is. Okay, so I'd like to um, spend a little bit of time here on an infographic um, of the end time events because when we walk out of here today, I want, hopefully, we can say, all right. There's, there's a lot of things going on, but, you know, the Bible does provide a framework that we can, with, I think, a, a high level of confidence, get at least an idea of here's about where we fit right now, and here's where we're going. And again, you know, we, we've talked about these things for decades, and, and I see things uh, filling out in ways that, at least in my lifetime, we've not seen. And it's, it appears that things are accelerating. At the same time, you know, in God's 
overall scheme of things, you know, a decade or two here or there um, is not much time. So here's a graphic, and I know, um, by the way, I'll, I'll make a PDF of this. Um, and I've borrowed uh, this graphic and re made it a little bit uh, from, from our church website, so this is information you can get with additional detail. It's not, it's not new. <laughs> I'm not bringing you any new truth today. But I do hope that we can, can put it in context. So you have, starting from left to right, you have the first four seals, and then you know, we, we go from red to real dark, and, and there's, um, I mean, I don't know who designed this, but you know, designers, um, subliminally put things in. It goes from red to really dark. And the darkest part of it is the seven last plagues, you know, that is just, I mean, it's a short period of time that is just ominous. It's a really dark time. We'll look into a little bit more detail. So you, get, you start with the first four seals, the fifth seal, sixth seal, seventh seal, and then in the seventh seal, you have the, the, the seven trumpets and the seven last plagues. Um, so if you, just, if you just think of this timeline, and, and uh, there's, there's one thing that I want you to really um, look at and see, and it's over in the purple area, and it's called the Day of the Lord. So if, if, and up, and the line up at the top, you can't see this, but it says um, the Great Tribulation. It's labeled here three and a half years of great tribulation embedded in the at the end of the three and a half years or included in the three and a half years at the end is a one year period and we know that um, for a number of reasons you've got days that are enumerated in revelation and also in the uh, by the prophet daniel um and i have another graphic which i, I might have been helpful to also show that i just don't i, I didn't do that so i mean these these are these are defined times of you know you basically all all of the things that happened for six thousand years you come down to this time of the end and the the justice of the Lord is um, wrought out in a one year period. So um, I've enlarged here. Here are the seven seals and. It starts with religious deception and ends with the seven trumpets. And um, I'd just like all of us to go to Matthew chapter 24 because Matthew chapter 24, um, in response to the ever-present question that disciples have, uh, Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21 uh, provides a very good framework for us to Look at the Associated Press and Reuters. I'll uh, show you some of the reports, and, and you just kind of can overlay them uh, to see where we fit in. So in verse 3 of, um, well, let's go to verse 1 and start in verse 1. We'll go back and forth here a little bit. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him, to show him the buildings of the temple. I mean, this was architecture that, I mean, it still exists to this day. Dan showed us last evening a rock down in the tunnel of the Western Wall that, according to their best calculation, weighs a million pounds. I mean, it's a, a big rock. And, you know, I can't help but think, okay, fine, all right, I mean, I get it. It's a big rock, it weighs a lot. It, it, it had uh, carved into the side places where, I mean, you could hook uh, material handling implements to it. But I don't know of a crane today that can pick up a million pounds. There, there may be one, but you, know, you just ask, how in the world did they, how did they do that back then? Um, so they were, they, they went to the Mount of Olives here, and they were, they, they were taught, I mean, Herod the Great was a big builder, and the, the disciples were impressed, understandably so. I mean, you, these big buildings, you know, to this day, people built towers and, 
it is architecture that we marvel over. This is what they were doing. And he, the disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, they were, the, they were here. They were still on the Temple Mount. And there's a pile of rocks. <laughs> um, I remember seeing when I was there that literally is a pile of rocks that were tossed down by the Romans and not one of those stones was left upon the other. So you see that that, that was fulfilled. Verse 3, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, I mean, they always wanted to be in on, on the scoop, you know, tell us. They came privately, you know. Maybe if we ask him just, you know, kind of man to man, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll tell us the answer to this burning question. Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And he said, come on over here. We're going to sit under this olive tree. And if you don't tell anyone else, I'm going to tell you. No, that's not what he said at all. He ignored their question and said, take heed that no one deceives you. And that should ring true to us today. Because the, the implements of deception have the capacity to be amplified like never before. Dave and I were just talking in the back, you know, and this is being webcast. As we talk, so people that are out there can listen and we record it. And we're doing it with consumer electronics. You know, we have what are called influencers that have followings from, you know, a couple tens of thousands to millions that basically produce their programming with a smartphone and maybe a laptop. So when Jesus said back then, take heed that you are not deceived, um, it's only, it's still the same, only more so. <laughs> and I'm I am fascinated, actually, at what people do with conspiracy. You know, you, you listen to someone at, at some outback that has 700 followers on YouTube who has appointed themselves to be an authority of, you know, pick something. And they listen to them. And the more absurd the idea the more people listen to him. I mean, it, it's, it's an unfortunate and uncanny thing of human nature. But it's not wise. Please, don't do that. Go, if, if you want advice on something, go to someone you know, that, is, that you know in the flesh and blood, that has already done what you want to do and take advice from a person like that. Because here's what, here's what we, we, we don't get was the deception. Every time you click, the cash register rings on the other side. Every time you click, the cash register rings. Do not be deceived, for many will come in my name <laughs> and say, I am the Christ. And before they say that is, the Lord told me. The Lord spoke to me this morning. Now, you know, I, I think we're maybe on the opposite end of that spectrum and, 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 and are maybe hypersensitive to something like that. I believe God inspires us, hopefully me, sometimes, okay? You know, I, it, it's, you know I didn't have a vision this morning, okay? Uh, but when you say the Lord spoke to me, I'm just, when you say, when someone says that, you're taking, you are now speaking for the Lord. It is, I think, the most common form of taking God's name in vain out there by quote-unquote believers. Not swearing, I'm not for swearing. 
You say, I am speaking for Christ. Seriously? That is something I'm very uncomfortable with, you know. Christ is speaking, okay, I'm reading and Christ is speaking, right? That's bona fide. Many will come saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So the number one thing that we see in the, in the seven seals is religious deception, and that started with Simon Magus back in the Acts, and it's continued down to this time. So if you want a, a timing in context, um, number one has been going on for 2,000 years, and it continues to get amplified. <clears throat> And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that, you're, that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I mean, these, these are words that speak of timing. They are sequential in nature, and they provide a time sequence and Jesus himself said, the end is not yet. There will be wars and rumors of war, and nations will rise against nations. That's been happening down through time. You know, what is the top-selling movie right now? It's Napoleon. You know, M M Napoleon Bonaparte was one of those guys in history that, you know, before he was defeated in Waterloo, I mean, he did some unbelievably obnoxious and audacious things like crowning himself emperor. <laughs> I mean, who does stuff like that? He made war. And then there are rumors of war, but the, the end is not yet. That's number two. Now, verse seven, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines. I mean, there have been famines you know, the, one of the famous ones was the Irish potato famine, you know, way back. I guess that was in the 18th century, if memory serves me correctly. We have, we have, not, we have not seen that today because of mechanized farming, because of uh, fertilization programs and um, pesticides and, and all of those things, and also... Um, developing through um, breeding and genetics plants that have um, a resistance to the plagues and stuff that have caused famines in the past. But, but, there's, but you can't trick nature. The problem is, take corn for example, and I'm not an expert in this, but my understanding is this, that we have so hybridized corn that we really only have a couple of strains. And if we, if somehow we would get some kind of plague or disease that attacks those strains, it could wipe out the entire corn crop across the United States and the world. And we would have a, diff a very great difficulty to, um, to recover from it. So, I mean, we, we've done a lot of things that have helped us, but we've also made ourselves vulnerable. For example, I mean, we drive a car, okay? I woke up this morning, and I don't know about your house, but mine was rather comfortable, you know, even though it's cold outside, and I didn't have to do what I did when I was a little kid, and that is to go down and you know, kind, kind of shiver, and you go get a shovel and get some coal and throw it into the furnace, and then, you, you know, you shiver until, you know, the fire starts burning and you huddle around the, the register to get warm. Okay? I mean, that's nice. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know what we are? We're vulnerable. Because at least in my house, it takes electricity to ignite the gas furnace. So if electricity goes off, you know, so does the furnace, except that I've got a whole house generator that is also connected to the gas, right? So you're really vulnerable. Where if you were, if you had coal and wood, it was a lot more work, but, you know, you could go for a month and not suffer, uh, you know, any cold. <clears throat> so we, we always trade convenience for vulnerability. We're very vulnerable at this time. So there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places, 
But all these things are the beginnings of sorrows. I think we know a little bit more about pestilence, don't we? <clears throat> Disease epidemics. Think about how, how much um, and how forever the world has changed through COVID. <clears throat> Didn't take long to shut down the world that time. Now, um, if it happens again, what will likely happen is we won't shut it down when we need to. <laughs> it's just um, the way it works. <clears throat> All these are the beginnings of sorrows, verse 8. Verse 9, um, it's very troubling. Then, you know, we have not yet, and then, and the beginning of sorrows, these are all words in the English language that are time-sensitive in nature. Then, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all, na all nations for my name's sake. Now, Jesus is talking to his disciples who became the apostles of Christianity and ambassadors for Christ. But, at this juncture, it should not, the fact should not escape us that he was also speaking to Jewish disciples. So this, this is a prophecy regarding Christianity, but it more broadly also as the Jewish people. It says here that you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. You will be. Now, of course, Judah has rejected Christ. I mean, it's like I said earlier, it's more precisely to his, his followers, but more broadly, it talks about the, 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 um, the plight of the, the Jewish people. And then many will be offended and be, will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound and the love of many, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's, it's not how you start the race, it's how you finish it. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations as a witness, and then shall the end come. It'll get preached whether we do it or not. I can say that confidently because it says it will happen and then the end will come. Um, so I'm going to drop down here to, um, well, maybe I'll just read, read through it here. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of the Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains... Um, this presupposes that the sacrificial system will be reestablished in Jerusalem prior to these events happening because, you know, you can't have an abomination of desolation in a holy place without the holy place being there. And, and again, you know, Dan is providing me a lot of fodder here. <laughs> I mean, last evening we looked at and he, he has a picture of three red heifers. The Temple Mount Institute, you know, they, um, they've got all the utensils. Uh, ten years ago when I was over there, they had a golden menorah um, up the hill from the Western Wall, all encased in bulletproof glass. All of these things are prepared. because the word of God will not return to him empty. I mean, that's what's behind this. It's not the Israelis. It's, it, you know, it's, you could say it's not Hamas. I mean, they're just all pawns, if you will, on a, on a, a big um, checkerboard that is playing out before us, and they're responding to stimuli and over-responding in some cases, and, you know, if you look at ancient history, God has worked through peoples <laughs> to punish his people down through time, the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, and even Pharaoh. 
you know, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And he did um, amazing things. And in the end, it was to uh, glorify the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation. And I've always, I mean, the, the, let's just let these words sink in. For then there will be great tribulation. Fair enough. I mean, that, that should suffice. Great tribulation? I mean, I can assure you that whatever we've seen and experienced, or whatever the Palestinians have experienced, it's not a great tribulation might be tribulation, but not great. But then he amplifies it. Such has not, as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. That's great tribulation. And if you look at um, the, the horrors of wars down through time, I mean, it's just unimaginable. Nor shall ever be. And unless these, those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So the, the probability of extinction is acknowledged by Jesus Christ here um, in a very explicit way. So I'll just stop there for now. We'll, we'll come back to this a little bit later. So the question is, where are we now? <laughs> you know, where, where do we fit in, and how does what's happening in the Middle East, I mean, what can we know? As, as, I, mentioned, as I mentioned before, um, prophecy fulfilled, once it's fulfilled, you can look back on it and say, wow. I mean, that got fulfilled with precision. I mean, you look back on the life of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, and you overlay that to the prophecies of Daniel and how he was to be cut off in the middle of the week. And there you go. Wow. He was crucified on Mittwoch, the German word for Wednesday, literally in the middle of the week. I mean, it, God has the power to declare the end from the beginning and then make it through through circumstances that, that drive it there. You know, if you, if you look at this, we're right there between four and five if we go back up to um, the timeline, you know, between four and five. Have been there for quite a while. We're not, the Great Tribulation hasn't started. And when we read the, when we get to the prophecy of um, Zephaniah, we'll see uh, that there are things that have to happen. Like, for example, Dan has a picture of the three red heifers, right? But before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, before Jesus returned, those heifers or one of their descendants has to get offered on an altar. So those are things that, that we need to follow, that, that we should be looking at. I mean, not being crazy about it, but to ignore it isn't correct either. So it, it seems like we tend to extremes. I mean, after either you fanatically look at prophecy and ignore, I mean, I, I got a letter from a person like that this week, um, that my secretary was, she opens my mail and she read this thing, and she's like, John, you <laughs> This guy's crazy. I said, I know. <laughs> I know. But he's fanatical about stuff like this. At the end of the day, he wanted money. <laughs> and he lined up a whole bunch of scriptures designed to make me feel guilty for not giving him a handout. And a big one, too. He told me how many thousands he needed. I'll give him some money. This is the right thing to do. There's, there's some history there. I know the man. But, you know, we, can we just be balanced? The answer is no. We're all weird, okay? Except you and I, and sometimes I'm not sure about you. Uh, 
Okay, let's look at what, what else we can learn here. <clears throat> so we have the seven trumpets. You know, we just go over in the scale. Look, look at what the day of the Lord looks like. <clears throat> Destruction of vegetation. That's in Revelation chapter 8. De devastation of the oceans. You want to talk about climate change and environment? I mean, right now, we have the cleanest environment we've ever had. That's, you can demonstrate that with science. We have the cleanest water. We have the cleanest this we ever, ever have had. If you don't believe me, go talk to somebody that remembers what the uh, river used to look like. The, what, what, I'm trying to remember the name of the river that flows into Cleveland. Cuyahoga River, thank you. <laughs> you could light it on fire, fire on a Saturday night and have a party, right? Can't do that anymore. But the devastation of oceans and rivers that are filled with blood and all kinds of other pollutants and the sun and the moon and the stars darkened, I mean, this is all happening in the space of a year. I mean, that will give climate activists legitimacy to speak out. <clears throat> Verse 5, tortuous human afflictions, enormous military destruction. You see, I mean, we look at, we look at what's happening at Gaza, and, we, and the Associated Press called it a moonscape. Okay. Compared to what? And then finally, the seven last plagues. So here are some scriptures. Um, I want you to kind of latch on to that term, the day of the Lord, because it's, it speaks about a period of time and timing. Here, here are just a couple. I'm just going to quote a couple of scriptures. I mean, this is something that maybe we haven't spoken on as much as we should have over the course of the last number of years, but okay, we have a reason to do it now. Notice in Amos chapter 5, verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. I know people like that. You know, you sit in an armchair and you draw things out about the end time events and the day of the Lord and you got it all figured out and you count, you know, when it's all going to start. And, and okay, that, that's fine. I, it, it's academic. But, but Amos says, woe to those who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and ended up with a bear. Or as though he went into the house, leaned on his hand, and a servant bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? The point is, that while it's important to do academic research and study on this topic, desiring it is a completely different matter because then it will no longer be an academic exercise. It will be a day worse than what we're seeing in Gaza that will, fit, um, that will affect their fa family, friends, and grandchildren. Here is what Joel said. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And what you, what you find in the prophecy is a consistent theme. Sun and moon will be darkened. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been. <laughs> a people come great and strong the like of whom has never been think about what we just read I mean that's not me speaking you know when we talk about armies into the hundreds of millions coming in from the east I mean it's the like of whom has never been. There have never been armies of multiple millions or hundreds of millions. I mean, these words are true. 
nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. So, I mean, that, that speaks to hope. Okay, it's going to be the worst year in the history of man, but after that, there will never be another time like it. That's the good news. Here is Ezekiel chapter 30. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. Okay, again, we, we go back and there are a specific, sorry, a specific number of days enumerated in the Bible that is for the Gentiles. The sword shall come upon Egypt, and great anguish shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain fall in Egypt, and take, they take away her wealth, and her foundations are broken down. So while, you know, you, you look at what's happening in, 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 in Gaza right now, and people, you know, quipple, it was, it was Piers Morgan and, and Dr. Peterson that had the, the conversation that I mentioned earlier, and he said, you know, Dr. Peterson, you know, you're a psychologist. You know, I, I, I find that I have a moral dilemma. Fair enough, I, I, I get it. I think Dr. Peterson answered very well. I mean, war is immoral, so you shouldn't be surprised that you have a dilemma. But in the end, at the end of the day, all nations, all nations will be judged and suffer consequences. Then we come back here to the overall timeline. So we go from red, we go four, five, six, and seven, and then the, you have the seven last plagues. Just look at that for a moment. Sores on beast worshipers. Oceans become blood. Rivers and fresh water become blood. I mean, it, the, it, it doesn't say <laughs> become like blood. It says come to be blood. Now, I haven't researched that, but um, on, on how literal that, that is. But, you know, if rivers and fresh water turn red... Not sure I want to drink it, right? The sun scorches earth. There is thick darkness in the beast kingdom. The Euphrates River dries up to make way for these huge armies. And then there's a massive final destruction. So that's the, I mean, if you, if you look at this context and this infographic, if you will, um, and you overlay it on Matthew chapter 24. It's right there in your Bibles to read. And if you want to fill in the details, there's a lot in Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel. And, you know, it, it takes a lot to piece it together. But um, the basic framework isn't that difficult. I mean, it's just taken us a, a couple minutes here to, to walk through that. So what did Zephaniah prophesy about the remnant of Judah? And this is a, a common misunderstanding, okay? Let's make, let's make sure we, we understand this clearly. Israel today is not Israel. And you say, okay, what do you mean? What I mean? It is, it is more accurately the nation of Judah, the descendants of Judah and Benjamin is what have, are the people that have come back to what they call Israel. So when you say you're an Israeli, that's true. I mean, a, a Jew is also an Israeli. But I, it's important to make that distinction because you have a vast number of people that are descendants of Israel that, will, that are prophesied to also return to the land at a later time that are not there yet. And that's a, that is a common, I think, misunderstanding of prophecy that is out there that somehow since 1948, the fulfillment of those prophecies of the tribes of Israel coming back to Israel being fulfilled. It's only being fulfilled in part. 
because it's the remnant of Judah. And I find it interesting that Zephaniah speaks to that with precision. So let's see what he says. And, and I've set this up now, hopefully, so that when, when we look at what Zephaniah said, we can, we can look at it with context and precision and ask ourselves the question, to what extent is what we are seeing today a fulfillment of what God said would happen in Israel? And I'm going to say time will tell. So here's end time Gaza. The coast of Gaza shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. That's, that's God speaking. And when you look at all the moonscape, the hellscape, if you want to call it that, at the end of the day, here's what's at work. God said that the sea coast will be for the remnant of the house of Judah. The remnant of the house of Judah has resettled the land, and they're going to own the sea coast. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. How do I know that? We'll see in a minute. They shall feed their flocks there in the houses of Ashkelon. They shall lie down at evening, for the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. Well, some have been returned, not all of them. And it's interesting if you go, I mean, we looked at this the last time, but I'll just remind you because I kind of went through that the last time and then I looked at it again and I thought, hmm, no, I didn't see all that. Ashkelon, at the time of David and Solomon, was under the control of the Philistines. And since 1940, early, early on, 48, Ashkelon has been under control of the remnant of the tribe of Judah. So some of this happened um, early on in the quote-unquote modern-day Israel. Actually, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of land that is occupied be, by the people that live in Gaza is much smaller than it was at the time of David. <clears throat> in the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening, for the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. That's Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 7. For Gaza shall be forsaken. And Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, so there shall be no inhabitant. This, folks, has never happened before. It's always been inhabited. You know, in Samson's time, Gaza was the red light district. That's where he found Delilah. <clears throat> it's always, always been inhabited. This is from the Associated Press, November 25th, 2023. Gaza has become a moonscape in war. When the battle stops, many fear it will remain uninhabitable. That's not me. That's Isabel Debray, writing for the Associated Press. We don't think Gaza will be inhabitable after they get done. Looks like it could be true. Associated Press. That's a drone shot. Straight down. I mean, God have mercy on the people that live there. I mean, that's... Horrid. 
but it's nothing compared to what is yet to come. That's just the reality. This is conventional <laughs> munitions. This is not nuclear. I mean, it's they're powerful weapons, to be sure. I mean, it's not the um, tiny little rockets that Hamas um, sends in there. But when you hear Benjamin Netanyahu speak, it's like he's got steel in his spine. And when someone says, wants to read him some case of morality, it, you know, he, he retorts, ceasefire? The United States of America wants to tell me to enter into a ceasefire? You're telling me? You're lecturing me? Did you do a ceasefire at 9-11 and what we have experienced is greater than 9-11? That's why I say he's got steel in his spine. This is a God thing. Because Sephaniah, under the inspiration of God, said, Gaza will be forsaken. The time will come, whether it's now or later, when Gaza will be forsaken. You can put money in the bank on that. Because if it's not so, then God is not speaking the truth. And if God is not speaking the truth, then we are all, of all men and women, most miserable. <clears throat> so where does all this all fall in the sequence of end time events? And we read, for Gaza shall be forsaken. In Sephaniah, he identifies with some precision. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued or the day passes like chaff, before, before, the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. These things, this is verse 1 and 2. Gaza will be forsaken before the day of the Lord, says Sephaniah. The day of the Lord is a period of time, a one-year period of time, immediately prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Gaza will be, sa be forsaken sometime before then and where we are today. So what happens then? You know, so you, you say, okay, before the day of the Lord, Gaza is forsaken. So what happens then between... I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the blue arrow there, there's some period of time, and and when you look at what is supposed to happen, you recognize that some period of time has to pass in order for those things to happen that are prophesied to occur. I mean, it can't just happen in two or three days or a week. There's some passage of time. For the sea coast shall be pastures. I mean, you bring in a D9, and, and the Israelis are really good at reclaiming land that is laid waste. I mean, they've figured out desalination. Um, they now have access um, right by Gaza to one of the world's largest um, reserves of natural gas just off the seacoast. Trillions upon trillions of cubic feet. <clears throat> Turning the seacoast in Gaza to pasture land um, is the easiest thing they are going to be able to do in this con conquest. The coast shall be, I mean, this is the word of the Lord speaking to Sephaniah. The coast, the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, but that sure rings true. If it's not ringing true now, it sure will be. It's not for... Ephraim and Manasseh and all the other tribes, it says the remnant of the house of Judah. A small amount. It's a small group. 
The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah, and they shall feed their flocks there. The houses, In the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening, for the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. We read this before. I just wanted to, you know, so what happens between Gaza being forsaken in the day of the Lord, there will be pasture land. It gets a little bit more specific. Notice, the sea coast shall be pastures with shelters for shepherds. And you kind of envision, you know, a tent, a shelter, you know, you order it from Coleman and Amazon, right? Well, that's not, this, the word for shelters here is only used once in the entirety of the Old Testament. And in my margin, in the New King James Version, it says, the word literally means excavations, either underground or huts or cisterns. Think of all the tunnels <laughs> and the underground uh, things that they have un uncovered. I mean, this... This, this speaks with precision and truth that's unbelievable. Okay. So we have all that. It's wonderful news. It's been awe-inspiring. I mean, you're all you know, kind of doing this. Okay. At the end of the day, I mean, it's important to do this, but the question is, what do we do in the meantime? I'm in Ohio, and I don't own any sheep. <clears throat> Yet, maybe uh, I have some land where I could put some sheep, but we don't have any uh, underground huts. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 is the companion scripture to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> I might just turn there and read the larger context. Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 21. <clears throat> You, in verse 25, it says, And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and the earth in distress of all nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them, failing them for the fear and expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken." Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And then it speaks to what we should be doing. Now when these things begin to happen, look up. And that seems counterintuitive. I mean, in, in times of distress, we tend to look down. But we're to look up. And lift your heads because your redemption draws near. Verse 36, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So there is, there is a command that says that we are to watch and pray and, and, and look at what is occurring in this world. We should not be ignorant, and, and we're not. I mean, I think we have a, a pretty good framework from the Scripture. We've only gone through kind of the, the rough framework today. There's a lot more detail. You need to know that so that we are not deceived, number one, and number two, not shook up by the events of today, which it's easy to do. And notice it says we're to look up for the redemption draws near. So I'd just like to quote a couple of scriptures that are not in the, in the presentation. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And 
And it's interesting um, that people with money, and it used to be that if you were a millionaire, you were rich. I mean, we're very close to the point where if you own a house, you're a millionaire. <laughs> it's, it, it's not quite there yet, but we're fast approaching that. To be rich now, you have to be a billionaire. And uh, they're investing a lot of money into what God wants to give to us. <clears throat> Verse 50 of, verse of, of, of chapter 15, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, you know, giving your body up to chirogenics and all of that, um, as the body will be raised, <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 37, but they're not going to be doing it because of the chirogenics. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put, immorta put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You see, that is why we watch and pray. That is why a great tribulation of such as the world has never seen before is worth it. And is not all doom and gloom because, as we read in Luke chapter 21, when, that, when we see these things begin to happen, we're supposed to look up. <clears throat> because our redemption draws nigh. Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse... And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. I mean, John wrote about that in chapter 1. I mean, this is clearly referring to Jesus Christ, the Word. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That's those that were changed previously that we just read. You see, Jesus Christ does not come to the Mount of Olives and touch down alone. He comes with an army of changed individuals and um, and changed in the most dramatic way from mortality to immortality. I mean, this is an entirely different dimension of life than what we experience today. That's, I mean, I'm, we can confuse terminology here, and we're going to say that's the first coming. We would generally identify it as the second coming, and it is, except... Um, in the context of what I'm about to read. So that is Jesus Christ coming. That is God coming to establish his kingdom on the earth in a very real sense the first time. Let's look at the second coming. This is probably where I get in trouble <laughs> as I've changed up terminology here just hopefully for, for effect. Jesus came, not to be confused, he came first as a flesh human being, but God intervening in the affairs of man, this is the first coming. Let's look at the second coming, Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That changes everything. And that also makes all of the other things leading up to this look kind of puny. God, the Father, in the new Jerusalem, dwelling with men. Maybe we should go read this to Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, seriously. It... It, it's interesting to me that individuals, you know, you, 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 know, you name them, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, for all their faults and obnoxious nature, whatever you, want, how you may want to characterize, have changed the world in their respective ways. And, and actually, Jeff Bezos, um, my, my best friend from college, worked for him, was vice president of global recruiting during a very growth, big growth phase. And just sat, I mean, Jeff Bezos, in, from 2000 to 2010, it was in, I think that's the time frame that uh, my friend worked for him, it was very egalitarian. Everybody had the same desk. You know, Amazon uh, famously made no, lost money every year, and he kept raising more uh, shares, and, you know, eventually, I mean, he... They dominated everything and, and then took, um, made, made a big change. These, these men have materially changed the world in ways that is amazing. But what are they really interested in? They would like to extend the runway, right? And are willing to invest millions to do that. You know, we read the prophecy earlier. All we need is for one of these guys to wake up one morning and say, you know what? I mean, the kingdom of God, it's all there. Here's how we, ex this is the change from corruption to incorruption. We got to preach this, you know, <laughs> throw a hundred million at it, which is chump change for some of these guys. Um, you can blast it all over the place. And I wouldn't be surprised if something like that might happen in some peculiar way. Because just like Gaza will be forsaken, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. And here's the good news. Verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely. Verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. God is at work in Gaza to make his plan a reality, and that plan extends to every human being because he so loved the world that he gave his only son. No father would normally do that. We live in dramatic times. Let's watch and pray and look up.